Hello and welcome to the MMQB podcast. I'm Conor. Albert Breer is here. I'm motivated because Albert, did you see the big uh, story coming out of Missouri and Texas A&M? Greatest college football story of the weekend. I'm pretty fired. No, up I, I think I might have missed this. That was a blowout, wasn't it? Didn't Texas it's A&M beat him by a million? It was a blowout. Yeah, um, I got I got a note from another podcast saying we're not good enough, and it showed up in my mailbox this morning. So I'm fired up about it. But the story from Missouri was that. So I guess Texas A&M has this cornerback called the Blanket. It's his nickname is the Blanket. And I like so it. I don't Missouri's... know if that one's been used before. It's hard to find like ones that haven't been used before. So that's credit for creativity there. Are you joking? I feel like there's been so many cornerbacks who've been called the blank. Really? <laughs> yeah, like a hundred of who? them. Who? Right? I mean, like, well, you you would just say he covers him like a blanket. Well, like, yeah, blanket like coverage and all of that. Blanket. But I don't know. But I've never heard like somebody actually nickname True. the blanket. It's not the saying. blanket. Yeah, it's yeah. not. So anyway, I've mis- heard of I've heard of like that term. I'm just Correct. saying I've never heard that used as a nickname, which is why I'm giving him credit for it. Okay. All right. That's fair. So the Missouri wide receiver gets into his hotel room and he finds a fleece Texas A&M blanket on his bed with a picture of the quarterback that says, get used to this, get ready for this. So whatever. And then Texas A&M just beats Missouri's ass. And then after the game, the Texas A&M coach is like, yeah, I didn't do that. No one I know did that. The Missouri coach did it himself to try to get his players gassed up. So not only do you get your ass handed to you in the biggest game of the season, but then you get exposed for faking your own bulletin board material. What oh. a double L from Missouri on uh, on Saturday. My yeah, God. is it like Eli Drinkwitz is the guy who like got like laws changed too, like NIL laws changed, I believe, in Missouri for recruiting purposes? I Probably. think that's right. Yeah. Can you kind imagine? Kind of like matches up, right? Can you imagine the national story, the security issues that would be involved if Texas A&M snuck into a teenager's hotel room to drop off a blanket and a photo of another human being? Like, how stupid (laughs) do you think we are? And God, I I love it. I love college. Like, that's why I love college football. I really do. Like, you can't. If you did that to an NFL player, they'd just be like, what the hell is this? Get this out of my, get this out of my room, please. Oh, yeah. The general mayhem in college football. Like, that's what's so great about it is, like, just when you, like, I always think of, like, the story. uh, The best one was the one when, um, I can't, I think it was Alex Collins. You remember that running back? Played for Seattle for a while. Yes. um, Played at Arkansas. And, I think he was the one who on national signing day, like he went to his high school to, um, he, he was at his high school to, to sign his national letter of intent. And they had the big ceremony, the way that they do at schools when got, kids are going to division one or whatever. And his mom literally stole his national line, letter of intent. Cause he didn't like his decision and drove off with it. <laughs> so at the ceremony, he had nothing to sign. So as, yeah, as one does, you know. Yeah, so uh, that's one that's one way to handle the problem if you're a parent. Yeah, um, I will tell you this though. After this weekend, Albert in the NFL, I would say some of these coaches at least need to try something like Eli Drinkwitz. I mean, there are some teams that are just falling off the reservation here. And uh, but this was a great weekend. This was full of statistical oddities. I think the first time we got two 100 yard defensive returns for a touchdown. There was a 345 Park was just having a field day with this one, right? Because you Can know I they were saving. Something? They were saving all their tweets like they were yeah. like, you know, because football was bad for the first four weeks and now it's good. And they're like, oh, here we go, you know. And they Can were. Can I say for. something too? Like I, I, I actually like when the bye weeks start. Cause I feel like the first few weeks of the season, it's just too much. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard to like, I, I like, and you're in the same boat as I am where you have to pay attention to everything. Like, I feel like when you get to that first bye week it finally becomes digestible. And then by the end of the season, when there are no bye weeks it's like there are a handful of teams you don't pay attention to anymore. But right. so that first month of the season, it's really hard to really digest everything that's going on while it's going on because there's just so much of it. Whereas once you start with the bye weeks and the London games and things get spread out a little bit more, it becomes a little easier to watch. By the way, uh, a heads up to our listeners. Uh, We're going to give you one more week of lightning round. Okay. 
And then if your team still sucks and is in lightning round every week, we're bouncing the lightning round and we're going to look ahead, do a first look ahead to the week uh, games coming oh, is this up. Like, uh, is, this, is this like our version of relegation? Yeah, we're going to relegate because you know what? we uh, You need to earn your spot in the podcast. Mm -hmm. And so I think that a first look ahead is a good idea. It's something that gives us a little bit um, of a different lane. And so much of this stuff is spun forward anyway, like halfway through some of these games, I'm already thinking uh, about the next week anyway, but you're right. And the reason is I feel like week four is bad every single year. And the reason that week four is bad every single year is because coaches still don't have a big enough sample size on their opponents. So they can't properly game plan. Everybody's hurt and tired and nobody's had a bye week And it's just been nonstop forward momentum. Nobody gets that second to get their head out of their ass. And so now that the bye week start, that refreshing feeling starts, everybody gets a break. Everyone gets a step away from football. I'm going to give myself a bye week here. I think in a little bit, Albert, just to, you know, freshen up a little bit i think that know? was a peter king idea at one point <laughs> I, like i'm not even kidding like i think peter had the idea to give us a bye week or something like that in the middle of the season i can't remember what it was not like collectively we'd all take it but like to give people a bye week like i, I it was an interesting idea I, not like i don't know if it was real feasible and i i'm sorry peter if that wasn't your idea but like i remember somebody having that idea I say let's do it. Um, all right, let's start with the Bengals and the Ravens. 41-38. Ravens over the Bengals. The Bengals slip to one and four. They're 0 and three at home. I, I my takeaway from this, Albert, is not very original, but I will just say that Lamar Jackson that touchdown to Isaiah Likely. Oh yeah. I I, I think it I think it was the best play that I've ever seen a quarterback make in my life. And I, I I know that sounds hyperbolic, but I don't – what play – I'm putting on the spot here. Better like, than, like, what, the third and 15 throw from Mahomes to Tyreek Hill in the Super Bowl. I guess, like – but but then we're talking about stakes, right? Well, so. yes. So if, let's say stakes removed, okay? Um, and then everything in consideration, just pure athletic ability, you know, all the things that you had to do. You drop the snap. You stiff-armed Sam Hubbard, who earlier in that game obliterated Derrick Henry. So, like, yep. Sam Hubbard's a giant dude who's very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, and then somehow you throw that ball to Isaiah Likely. I'm just, like, what what play is more unbelievable than that? Just on its own. Like, you show these to aliens. They don't understand the playoffs, the regular season. I think that play, they're just like, my God, that's, that's unheard of. Yeah, I mean, like, that was... I, like and it, 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 it just it's like one of those things for me watching it was like they were behind pretty consistently in the second half and they were coming back. I think they were down by 10 points three different times. Um, just unbelievable. You know what I mean? Like to be able to gather yourself in that moment. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, like, we'll go back to my fourth grade team here. Like I see like how kids like handle bad snaps a lot you know and how uh, those sorts of operational issues can cause problems and um you know it's like i it almost like like when you see a guy in that situation with that level of player running at him like the bengals who in that situation see the ball on the ground and now all of a sudden it's go you know so like every one of the pass rushers is now his ears are pinned back and he's going for the ball which ostensibly means he's going for you too. And to be able to gather yourself in the moment, pick the ball up off the ground, break contain, and then throw it back across your body to Isaiah likely was insane. Um, best quarterback play I've ever seen. I don't know about that, but it was pretty good. It's I, I, I don't, I just don't remember being able to see anybody do all of that at once. And there are games, obviously when Lamar does not look, half is dialed in and I'm not, you know, there are going to be games when Lamar, none of this works. Right. And he does the same thing, but he throws an interception or he falls out of bounds or he gets sacked and it fumble and he fumbles the ball. But when he is dialed in, yeah, I, I I'm starting to get it like, and, and I know that sounds crazy, but I'm starting to get 
why you build everything around him, why you invest in it week after week, and why I think ultimately he will win a Super Bowl. Because I do think that when he gets to the playoffs, yes, the results have been underwhelming so far, but if he plays a game like he did Mm -hmm. on Sunday against the Bengals, who are a good team. I mean, they're one and four, but they're a good team. If he plays anybody in the NFL like he played the Bengals on Sunday, the Ravens are going to win. So I I actually heard an interesting theory on this, um, which has floated around with a couple of teams, which I think is interesting when it comes to evaluating quarterbacks. And the theory is that quarterbacks who run a lot, by the end of the year, they're beat up in their fundamentals – and their mechanics start to suffer because of it, okay. which affects them throwing the ball in the playoffs. And I had never heard anybody say that before. Um, I did probably a few months ago, and then I kind of shopped it with a couple of other people, you know? And it's sort of one of these things that I, I, I think has become a more prevalent thought when people are evaluating quarterbacks and looking at quarterbacks and, like, the subtle difference between – you know, a Lamar, a Josh Allen, a Patrick Mahomes, like what those guys look like. You know what I mean? Like Mahomes rarely runs to run. You know what I mean? Like Mahomes, they rarely call run plays for Mahomes. Except after he faked an ankle injury in the Super Bowl against the Eagles. <laughs> Allen and Lamar, <laughs> Allen and Lamar, they do, right? Like Allen and Lamar are legitimately part of the run game. Right. So that'd be the one question. But I like I think if he's playing like this, like there's no doubt, you know. There's no doubt that if if they can get him to January playing this way, they're going to have a shot. Now, that's the challenge, is getting him to January playing that way. And can you manage the damage on his body so you have the same guy in January that you have right now on October 7th? Like, that to me is the biggest challenge. But you know what I really love about that Ravens team? And I wrote about this this morning, so this is a shameless plug. I'm not going to hide from that. Everyone um, should read Albert's column, by the way. Yeah, but uh, like I, what I love is like the way that the Ravens have turned over so many important spots on their roster, and now you can see them getting better. You know, like it's going and letting go of. I think it's three starting offensive linemen from last year who accounted for sixty percent of the of the of the starting lineup on that on the line in the AFC title game who have 24 seasons of NFL experience between them and John Simpson, uh, Kevin Zeitler and Morgan Moses. And they more or less, I mean, Pat McCarry's in there, but there are three guys who are year three, year two, year one, Roger Rosengarten, um, Andrew Voorhees and Daniel Falele. And then on defense, they let Patrick Queen go. They're relying on Trenton Simpson. Who's in his second year. They let Jadevian Clowney go. They're looking for more from Adafi Owe and David Ajabo. And I'm not saying every one of those is going to work out, but they're counting on their own ability to draft and develop over everything else. And then you look at how it carries over on the coaching staff. Like Zach Orr, and I think we've talked about him some here, right? My right, cousin, Connor? yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Zach Orr, your, your, your long-lost cousin. Um, <laughs> he's 32 years old. It was a dice roll for them. I'm going with Zach or as their defensive coordinator. And you look at how many of the other guys, they had a lot of other options. Anthony Weaver, now the coordinator in Miami um, was there last year. Denard Wilson um, who coached there is now uh, the defensive coordinator in Tennessee. There are guys who knew the system who probably had a little more experience than, or they could have tried and gone, tried, tried to go get Jesse Minter and steal him away from Jim. You know, um, they, gambled on Zach Orr because they believed that they developed a really good one. And it didn't look good in week two. It didn't look good for anybody in week two. They lost the Raiders. You know what I mean? Like, but if you roll back two years, you see Mike McDonald um, was new and had replaced Wink Martindale. And there were questions about that in week two of Mike McDonald's first year as DC, they gave up 500 yards and 42 points to Miami. And these same questions came up. And John Harbaugh has done such a good job of sticking with people. You know what I mean? And just like trusting that like what they're doing is the right thing and trusting that they develop the right people. And this gives them such a huge advantage, Connor. Like how much does their offensive line cost right now versus what it cost last year? Yeah. Right. You're right. And so like letting Patrick Queen go allows you to pay the top of the market price for Rokon Smith. And 
letting Jadevi and Clowney go gives you younger players playing important snaps, which may give you a better chance at the end of the year. I, I'm just so impressed with the whole operation, you know? And I know a lot of people want to bury them after two weeks, but um, I think this was sort of the gamble all along. And a lot of those guys came up really big um, on, a, I, on a big regular season stage. On a really big regular season stage, are you are you uh, are you writing the eulogy for the Bengals yet? No, that's what I was just about to say. So uh, we had uh, a couple weeks ago, we played a fun game uh, with the Jaguars, and uh, we got a lot of heat for it on social media. Where I told you to stop when uh, you saw a win coming, and we didn't stop for a long time. And lo and behold, they turned out to be owned for. Uh, and so I, I think we were kind of on the right track there. I do uh, see a team missing from this rundown now that you, you mentioned it. Uh, oh, did I miss the Jags Colts? Oh, you're right. Yeah, throw them in there in the lightning round, Connor. Yeah, throw them in there in the lightning round. Uh, everyone loves Joe Flacco. Um, I don't so, want. I don't. I don't want to get. I don't want to get ourselves in any more trouble here than we already are with uh, with people of North Florida. That's true. Um, so, but you know, we don't have to do the same game here. But okay, so the Bengals are one and four. Uh, this this Sunday night, they play the Giants in New York, and the Giants had a signature win this weekend over Seattle. I think that they're playing tough. They could get Malik Neighbors back, but I don't think that game is unwinnable for the yeah. Bengals. Let's say they get lucky in that one, and they end up 2-4. and four. Then you have Cleveland at Cleveland. I mean, at this point, who are we picking the Browns to beat, Albert? I, I, you know, this team looks anemic offensively, you yeah. know, and okay, at that point, they're three and four. Okay. And then they have Philadelphia at home. Again, toss up, uh, you know, let's say they win that game. Then you got Vegas. Then you got Baltimore again. Then you got Los Angeles. That's right. a winnable game. No, but you know, now like, you're, but now you're, now you're, now you're potentially five and four going into Baltimore against a team that you probably should have beat, right? And then look at the back end of their And schedule. if you beat Baltimore, you're six and four coming off a win in Baltimore. Monday night football on December 9th, they have the Dallas Cowboys in Dallas. Okay. And then after that, the Titans, the Browns, the yeah. Broncos, the Steelers to end the season. I'm just like, this team still has, now they're running out of time to do it. But right. I think you play that way. So, but the so mediocrity can... of the conference, but like the conference has been pretty mediocre to this point. So. I mean, they're probably no more than I would think two games. I don't. I got to look it up, but I I would think two games out of a playoff spot right now. Now there are a lot of teams between them and and that spot, but only two games out of a playoff spot. I'm mean, Joe Burrow is playing great football. Um, Jamar Chase looks like the best receiver in the league. T Higgins is getting his stride. The running game, like you're starting to see Zach Moss and Chase Brown play better. Um, I, the defense is the question, man. Like, I think this is all going to come down to, you know, Lou Anarumo's group and what you can do to generate a pass rush and, um, you know, where they are um, with their secondary and the corner situation in particular. I think that's the swing factor. But certainly the offense and the quarterback um, is they're, – they're playing well enough to, to win games, and I would expect that they're going to start winning games in bunches here um, next yeah. week. I mean, okay, so the what the uh, standings here, three and two, three and two, one and four, one and four. Yep. Uh, the Browns are on a three-game losing streak. The Steelers are on a two-game losing streak. Baltimore's on a three-game winning streak. Like this division's going to be weird. It's going to stay weird, and I don't think the Bengals are going anywhere. It's the greatest time of year again. Football is back, and it's here to stay until February. Over a million fans, guys, across 33 states got in the game last year by making picks on Underdog, where you can win up to 1,000 times your money just by choosing higher or lower on your favorite player's stats, like touchdowns, passing yards, and more. I have friends who like Underdog, who love using the app simply because it's easy to use. You don't have to learn all of the complicated terminology. You don't have to bet like an old sharp. All it is is picking higher or lower. It's easy to use. The app is very simple, slick, well-designed. Making picks on Underdog is straightforward, and signing up is even easier. Just head over to 
to Underdog's simple-to-use mobile app or underdogfantasy.com and sign up with the promo code MMQB, and Underdog will give you a free pick to use on your first cash pick'em entry, plus up to $1,000 in bonus cash when you deposit. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code MMQB to claim your new customer special of a free pick and your deposit offer. You must be 18 years or older, 19 in Alabama and Nebraska, 19 in Colorado for some games, 21 in Massachusetts and Arizona, and present in the state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply, void in Colorado, concerned with your play. Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit ncpgambling.org. In Arizona, that's call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. 1-800-639-8783 1-800-639-8783 or next step text to 53342 and in New York call the 24-7 Hope line at 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY that's 467-369. Let's move on to the Texans and the Bills. I mean, I think that you have to go right to the end of this game and I thought that this was the best job that Sean McDermott has done handling a situation like this publicly in terms of the fallout. Now, if you're a coach, right, you know, anytime, you know, you have one of these decisions where, you know, and well, let's back up here and rewind the clock. Uh, The Bills lost to the Texans on a last second field goal uh, from Kymie Fairburn. Beautiful field goal, by the way. It was like a hook in. And what looked like when it it came off his foot, it looked like, like not even close to being good. It looked exactly. And so what we had in this situation uh, was Buffalo with the ball, first and 10 on their own three-yard line. Houston had all three timeouts. And so what did the Bills do? Josh Allen, incomplete pass. uh, Josh Allen, incomplete pass. Josh Allen, incomplete pass. So you went from 32 seconds on the clock to 21 seconds on the clock. You punted at 16 seconds. C.J. Stroud got the ball with seven seconds at the Buffalo 46. Now, and, and C.J., he he danced around in the pocket a little bit in that one, and I was like, is he going to get rid of this ball? And he did just in time. Texans used the timeout. Fairburn hits the kick, and everything's good. But if you're Sean McDermott, James Cook was averaging 4.1 yards per carry in this one. Yeah. Josh Allen was not playing his best, and – was potentially banged up, but was averaging 13 and a half yards per carry in this one. Like, you know, and we're always going to question what you didn't do versus what you did. I see the reasoning why you would try. Well, to I feel run- like this is so like, don't want to jump in, but like, don't you feel like this is the, this is like the, the, the situation where, and they don't have any timeouts. So it makes it a little more difficult, but you, you, run a run play and if you pop it then you run up and spike the ball and try to do something with it you right. know what i mean like and that's if you what run a run said, play what that's what and, that's what mcdermott said he should have done after yeah your game. strategy yeah. like it's one of those situations where as a coach you run it on first down and your strategy from there is basically predicated on what happened on that first down run yeah because at the very least, like you're gonna, they're gonna burn. They're gonna have to burn a timeout there. And if they have no timeouts with seven seconds left, we're talking about something completely different. Also, if they can pick up a couple yards in the run game, they're not punting out of their own end zone. I do think that this is an interesting situation because you know McDermott is one of those tenured coaches, and you don't think about things. Now, I've I've seen things that are totally ridiculous this morning, like oh, um, like hot seat rankings from like you know uh, Jake whoever the hell, you know, and so those things exist out there, you know, um, that's, his, that's the byline, right? It's Jake, whoever the hell, but, um, you know, I, do I think that the bills are, you know, trying to force him out at this point? No. Do I think that this season in particular is one where a lot of McDermott's game management is going to come under the microscope? Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I think those are games that you have to win. Those are games well, that you're going to have to handle better. And he has struggled with clock management in the past. Yeah. I mean, this is also a turning point season for them, you know, yeah. like with, with so much of the roster turning over with Josh Allen in a different place, 
um, with so many young guys playing key roles. Um, no Mitch Morse, no Stefan Diggs, no Tredavious White, no, um, you know, no Micah Hyde or Jordan Poyer. Like they have so many guys that are new in key spots and they have new leadership on the team. Like Terrell Bernard's a captain. He's what in his third year. Now he's gonna be a really good player, but it's a significant change in the way the team is set up. And so, like, I think some of the player development we saw over the first three weeks is outstanding. Where do you go from there? Like, right. That's a big question because I think, you know, coming out of this year, what you want, if you're ownership, is you want to see your quarterback playing well, of course. And also, like, you want to see a bunch of guys, like, as ascending young players in the roster that are around your, your Terrell Bernards, your, you know, Ed Olivers, your Josh Allens. Um, you want to see Cole Bishop playing really well at safety. You want to see, you know, James Cook coming off of a 12, 1300 year yard year. You want to see Keon Coleman coming on <clears throat> at receiver. You want to have a decision to make on Greg Rousseau and whether or not to pay him, you know, like that's the sort of things that you want coming out of this year. And so player development is going to be a huge part of it. I think that they're really at a critical point with that group of players, like where, is this going to be the next core of the team? Like all those guys I just, you know, ticked off, like is, are the Russo's and the Bishops and the Cooks and the Coleman's, um, Khalil Shakir, like, are, is that the next group that you're going to pay and reward and, you know, chase a championship with, with Josh Allen over the next five years? Like that's the question. And that's what I think makes this year so critical for where they are and critical for Sean McDermott in particular. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, Houston, this is one of these games that you don't have, um, Joe Mixon again, uh, when you you're get, clunkers. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. you get, you get 42 yards out of cam Akers and a touchdown, which has helped by the way, I'm just going to say this right now. Um, I am, uh, I'm in a high stakes fantasy league and let me just run down my lineup. Okay. Real quick for you. Uh, our quarterback was to a tongue of Iloa. Our running back was Christian McCaffrey. Um, uh, our wide receivers were Cooper Cup, Debo Samuel, and Malik Neighbors. Okay? So we have nothing. We have no one. No one's playing right now. And I let my uh, uh, my co-captain uh, go out and get us some new players. And he is just crushing it on a weekly basis. We have ripped off two wins in a row. If we get a decent performance tonight... Um, uh, then we will have ripped off three wins in a row. The cavalry is slowly is coming back. Maybe Christian McCaffrey's Achilles miraculously recovers. Cam Akers is one of our dogs right now. So scoring a lot of, coming up big in a couple big spots. But that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, 42 yards and a touchdown from Cam Akers, but it's not Joe Mixon. And it's not punishing the defense the way that you want it yeah. to, right? Um, and... You know, even your bigger bodied backs, you're getting about two yards of carry. And Buffalo did play tough. I mean, there were some big fourth down stops in this game, big moments for the Bills defense. I thought, you know, that you were probably happy about when you're moving on and uh, watching film today. Um, but the fact that they come out with a win like this is is a total trampoline for the rest of the season. Yeah, and, and they didn't look very good a couple of weeks ago against Minnesota. And I remember talking to some of the Minnesota coaches who felt like, they th they actually it's a weird thing to say, but they felt like it would actually be good for the Texans because the Texans had won a certain way um, since D'Amico got there, and Minnesota through what Brian Flores does on defense through um, you know like Kevin O'Connell and the different looks and moving Justin Jefferson around the way that he does on offense, they were able to take Houston out of its comfort zone, and. Um, you know, one of the coaches there said to me, he's like, I think that like Houston's a really good team that kind of got taken out of its element a little bit against us. And I think it's going to be good for them long-term to have come out of that. And um, I, so I sort of agree with that. You know, like I think it's still a team that's growing, but you look at the way CJ played yesterday. Um, you mentioned the plays down the stretch, but the way he's spreading the ball around right now, and we'll see how long Nico Collins is out. That's a tough one for them. But to have like eight different receivers have multiple catches is pretty outstanding, you know? Yeah. And so he spread the ball around great. The run game survived, I would say, the, the, loss of, um, the loss of Mixon and was relatively effective given the circumstances. 
Um, and then the defense did a really good job. Which uh, Josh Allen was nine of thirty, I think, it was something ridiculous, right? Josh Allen was. Let me get the exact number here: nine of thirty for one hundred and thirty-one yards and a touchdown. That's a fifty-six point four quarterback rating. Yeah, yeah. So to be able to like gut it out last week, and I don't think it was their best game against the Jaguars. They shouldn't have. I mean, they were sort of like playing with their food against the Jaguars, and they wind up, you know, winning that one. And then to come back and hold off a Bills comeback, like, you know, these last two weeks haven't been perfect. But, you know, if you can win the ones that aren't, I think that really winds up serving you well. And next week they go to New England, which um, probably wouldn't, shouldn't be a close game. Everybody likes everybody likes Ball State on the schedule. You know that's a that's a good one. You it's know, beautiful up here this time of year. It's raining right now, <laughs> but usually it's beautiful this time of year up here. Um, and, and their general manager is very familiar with the area. So, ah yes, um, Cardinals Forty Nine ers Albert. Game. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I'm done with revenge games. Uh, by the way, Stefan did. Uh, I am game. most certainly. I'm most certainly not done with revenge games. Six catches for 82 yards for Stefan Diggs in the revenge game and a very sad, sort of depressing post game handshake with Josh. Yeah, Allen. that, that kind of like kind of like ripped my heart out a little bit. That sucked seeing that. They used Too to be bad. best friends. I know they were such they were so close. I remember doing a story on um, on the Bills recovering from the 13 second game and talking to Stefan Diggs about it. And he was just like, oh, it's awesome. We go to Josh Allen's house. We hang out all the time. We have wings together. And, you know, it just made me believe in, like, buddy comedies, you know, again. You know, it was like they were kind of like the Buffalo buddy cops. And and now you've you lost know, all faith in humanity. You know, I just Sorry, I, Connor. I, I want to see friendships prevail. Anyway, um, I think what I think was my favorite game of the week was uh, Cardinals beating the 49ers. Yeah. How about 23. that? So first time Albert ever that Kyle Shanahan loses a game in which he is going into the fourth quarter ahead by 10 or more points as a head coach. Pretty wild. He was 38 and Oh going into this one. And I love this game for several reasons, and I'm just going to list them off here. The Cardinals just all of a sudden started throwing big personnel at the 49ers. Like, they hadn't used, uh, like, a jumbo set all year. And they ran mm -hmm. the MF and Tebow pass with Kyler Murray. He's five foot nine, And they ran the Tebow goal line pass uh, to get Making a much the jump part of it necessary. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of a jump, he did a fadeaway, which yeah. is so cool. I mean... They, Kyler Murray, when he broke free for that, uh, the touchdown run at the, at the beginning of the game, mm -hmm. just think of the utter gall that it takes to play this 49ers defense, Fred Warner, you know, this team full of excellent defensive players and you break through the line, you're ba barely over the line of scrimmage and you put your finger up to signal a touchdown and you're 44 yards away from the end zone. Like... I loved every minute of the Cardinals coming in here and just saying, we don't give a, you know what? I mean, they, the, the forced fumble on, uh, cause let, let me look up the name here because I did not Jesse Lakeda. I think that was like his first defensive snaps of the season. Yeah. And he just comes into the game and forces an incredible fumble on Jordan Mason and Kyler Murray to Marvin Harrison. I'm sure you enjoy yeah, that. On the fourth play. and six. I and mean, yeah. Well, no, I mean like the the Mac Wilson pick where uh, yeah. Roy Roy Lopez got his hand on it, um, the twelve play seventy three yard drive, um, you know Kyler Murray drawing the roughing flag on the touchdown pass on that, which set up the two point conversion, which was a ballsy move. But I think it's like what we always say, like when you're going into like a place like San Francisco, like you want like the underdog to be doing stuff like that to be taking some chances because they are the underdog and you do have a little bit of, um, I'd say you do have a little bit of freedom to do that, you know? Um, and then, and then, yeah, like the, the, the fourth and five throw to Marvin, um, you know, the new kicker coming in and, 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 and delivering for them. Um, it's just all the way around, even at the very end, you know, like the, the, the 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 interception with Jalen Thompson coming on the blitz. And that's like kind of a balls out call for that situation. You know, sending a safety on a blitz. 
And uh, you know, he winds up getting to Purdy and causing the interception, which I believe Kaiser White was the one who came down with that. Yes. Um, it, like they've been a competitive team for the last two years. And it's good to see like that that competitive team has started to learn how to win. And I looked this up after the game, and I think it's really interesting. The last two draft classes, they've had 21 picks. And 11 of those 21 picks have been in the top 100. And I think you're starting to see guys like really – start to come to life, you know, within that group, your Marvin Harrison's, your Paris Johnson's like, it's just, it's a, um, it's a team that I think is very much on the rise. And I don't think they're going away that now it doesn't mean they're going to win 12 games or anything like that. But like, I don't think there's a bad team in the NFC West. I'll put it that way. I had them winning nine games this year and uh, just starting to, yeah, I had them as my dark horse. Yeah. Just, I I, I also, you, you know, what else I think is interesting is, um, that I think Kyler took the video game thing personally. I think How could he, you not? <laughs> I think he took, I, I think that like, I honestly, your own think, agent allowed that to be in the contract. I honestly How could think, you not take I, it personally? I, I honestly think, but I honestly think that was like a turning point for him because like, remember he's like the, it's not like Kyler Murray isn't a prideful guy. He might be the best high school quarterback in the history of the state of Texas. Right? Like up here in Massachusetts, like with apologies to to like Matthew Hasselbeck, like I like it's not hard to be the the greatest quarterback in the history of Massachusetts or the state of New York. Or apologies to Vinny Test- Testaverde, and I can keep doing this. But um, it, like the best high school quarterback in the history of the state of Texas, he I think went forty five and zero in big school Texas high school football over three years starting. He went to the nat went to the playoffs at Oklahoma. Like this is a guy who hasn't lost a lot in his life, you know, and who has always been sort of at the top of the heap. And so this is a prideful guy who I think when everybody started to make fun of him, um, all the memes, all that stuff, I actually think it did have an effect on him where in a good way, where I think he like looked in the mirror a little bit. Then he had to like the challenge of learning a new offense for the first time in forever. Cause he'd run the air, air raid in high school and college and the pros. And um, I think you're seeing the result of it now, which is a really, really good NFL quarterback. I'm down the wormhole now. Um, I'm trying to find the greatest uh, football players of all time from uh, Massachusetts. Um, so the greatest Zachary, quarterback, the greatest high school quarterback, Zachary Giles. History. I don't want to offend ever, anybody who might be sensitive about this. So the greatest high school, the greatest quarterback in the history of the state of Massachusetts, high school wise, is probably Doug Flutie. This is since two thousand. Um, so Matt Hasselbeck, Tim Hasselbeck, um, shout out Brian St. Pierre, who was my year, who played at St. John's Prep, same high school as Bill O'Brien and uh, Brian Kelly, by the way. Um, mm. But the greatest player, well, who would be the greatest player in the history of the state? Like Pat Fryermuth went to, yeah, he went yep. to Brooks, Pat. the Brooks School. The Brooks that School, yeah. So the prep schools have started, the prep schools have started to steal the best players away. They've started to recruit lately. Boston seems like a kind of a tight end guard state or Massachusetts. I think that's fair. You know? yeah, I think that's fair. Pete Kendall, um, it's from, uh, from down my way where I near where I live now. Um, I believe he went to Archie's, which Archbishop Williams. Um, it's lame that you guys kind of pretend that Connecticut is part of your state. No, we don't, you know, like that's Connecticut's not, that's kind not, of like your farm team. That's not even close to true. Like this list has AJ Dillon on here. AJ Dillon's from Connecticut. Is he? Did he, is and it, this is like mass mass live. He, AJ, yeah. He's from Connecticut. Oh, yeah, but he went to. There's high a couple school. Connecticut guys on here, and I'm just saying, you know, like you know, we don't mm. like we don't claim Connecticut. I don't think you'll ever find a Massachusetts like like the, person like who claims team. Connecticut. Connecticut's like the the. I mean, state Connecticut is to. a farm team state. Yeah. Connecticut is a farm team state, and I feel like it's sort of like it's sort of like Antarctica, where it's like they we just draw resources from it, and it belongs to like everybody in the tri-state area. Connecticut, you know? Connecticut is like. Um, Connecticut's like a West Virginia or even like for a lot of people in Indiana where a lot of people have been there just because they've driven through it. But like most people who've driven through it didn't stop other than to go to the bathroom or like get Roy Rogers at the, uh, at the rest area. Yeah. Like 
It's like, oh, he put clams. By the way, that was an old friend of mine's favorite. One of my, my, my old, one of my best friends from college. His favorite thing about driving back from Ohio to New Jersey. He's from New Jersey. Was that the Pennsylvania Turnpike had Roy Rogers at the rest stops? Ooh. He's a huge Roy the, Rogers guy. The, what is it? The golden, gold something, gold rush chicken sandwich. That's what it's I, all about. I think I'd get the burger when I stopped there. He was he loved it for some reason though. Like I thought it was okay. It's fine. It wasn't like it's, I I just I'd never met anybody who was so enthusiastic about Roy Rogers. It's not real meat anyway. So it my buddy really Evan matter. Madlinger, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the just to get this back on the rails for a second, the 49ers, <laughs> I'm not particularly concerned about albert i mean like or, you know it's just like okay they're two and three and they're gonna be fine i mean this is a big yeah, game be... for brandon Ayuk, and, and i feel like they finally got him going um mm -hmm. george kittle is quietly playing uh really excellent football and has all season i and mean he so... had a touchdown catch against the patriots where he looked like king kong yeah like, it was just like oh like over like three guys you know what i mean like he's playing really good ball and brock purdy's but like this is probably brock purdy's Worst game of the season, right? And Christian McCaffrey, I think at some point will be back. I have trust I mean, in the German, in German <laughs> medicine. Do you? <laughs> All right. Well, that's have good. A little faith. You know? All right. Um, my, my, my last name is German, so. Okay. Have a little right. faith. Um, Cowboys Steelers. So this one was really interesting because uh, it, first of all, it started at like 10 o'clock, which is just absolutely miserable. And, <laughs> Um, and, you know, play through the lightning, you know, let's, let's go. Um, I fell asleep and, uh, I, like I was dozing off in the third quarter. Yeah. Um, we had sort of this situation where the stage was set for Dak Prescott to have his hero narrative, uh, because him, the him and CD lamb thing is getting uncomfortable. Uh, I think we went to break uh, for one of the commercials, right? Was it right before halftime? Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike Chirico and Chris Collinsworth are saying, oh, read his lips, read his lips. And CeeDee Lamb is saying something about it's somebody's fault. It's somebody's fault. You know, and Dak Prescott is just standing there like with his head down, like, my God, just like mm -hmm. leave me alone. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, you could tell that they're like clearly frustrated with one another. They're annoyed with each other. Um, but, but Dak played excellent down the stretch. But Dak played excellent excellent down the stretch i mean you know you get the ball back with and need a touchdown absolutely have to have it you go to lamb early in the drive you know mm -hmm. and mike mccarthy i thought the play calling was good kept them ahead of the sticks like everything was comfortable it didn't look rushed and you know you kind of neutralized tj watt you had him out of your face and I, I just thought all in all it was a nice moment for the cowboys who i think needed this kind of so, gut check victory against the quality defense so jalen tolbert jake ferguson Cavante turpin rico dowdle i got the names here brevin span Ford, jalen brooks luke schoonmaker uh hunter lupke um <laughs> what a critical catch right their fullback uh like this is what you have to do when your quarterback's making $60 million a year. It's the reality of it. It's like that if the quarter part of the deal, when the quarterback takes that check is now there is more on you to make it happen. And I always think that this is the biggest question with, um, this is the biggest question with these guys when you're getting ready to pay them. The question you really need to be asking is, can they win with less? can they make up for some sort of deficiency in the roster that we're not going to be able to pay to fix? And I always thought like Brady and Manning were the ultimate examples of it, right? So Manning won a lot with a deficient defense. Brady could win with average weapons around him playing a certain style to facilitate a really good defense. Um, but it's like, can you, can you be the team's margin for error? You're not creating margin for error. You are the margin for error. And I think Dak last night showed us he can be the Cowboys margin for error. If they're having trouble at left tackle and they got to kick Tyler Smith outside and you know their first round pick needs more time at that position, fine. If he's got to th if he's got to go away from CeeDee Lamb who had just one catch for 9 yards in the second half. And he's got to rely again on the Tolberts, the Fergusons, the Turpins, the the Dowdles. Like, what's the collective salary of all those guys I named? 
<laughs> like three million bucks. I'm yeah. not even kidding. Like seriously, like you 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 tick down those names. It's like those guys are probably collectively making three or four million bucks. But if you're the quarterback who's making that much money, that's what you have to do. And so that's what I'd be encouraged by is like seeing Dak put together a 16 play 95 yard drive, a 15 play 70 yard drive and score fourth score touchdowns in the fourth quarter to cap those drives. I like, I, I don't know. I was really impressed with Dak last night. It wasn't perfect, but like, I think that that's what you're looking for. So two things that kind of, and they won without DeMarcus Lawrence and Micah Parsons. Right. That, I mean, that's a big thing too. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing you mentioned what happens when you take the check. And I think that's a good point. Here is the biggest thing that needs to happen when you take the check. When the ball is on the ground, okay, and there's a snap fumbled near the goal line and the game is on the line, Dak Prescott did not hesitate and he threw his body on top of the ball. Mm -hmm. And for anybody else who's never done that before, you know that is going to be absolutely excruciating yep. on the pain scale because you can't really brace your body for that, right? Nope. I mean, there's a fumbled handoff. The ball just comes shooting out. And pr as soon as Prescott sees it, I pulled it up, takes one step, and then he absolutely dives for the football. And I think it was Minka Fitzpatrick that was on the other side that was trying mm -hmm. to dive for it at the same time. Like, that hurts, dude. Like, it really hurts to lay out yeah. for a football. And remember what, remember what Cam Newton did in the Super Bowl? Yeah, I was, that was exactly what I was thinking about. Now, you know, I, I hate to be football cliche guy, but that has a multiplying effect, too. No because doubt. Because if the $60 million quarterback is willing to do that, no doubt. No one else can not do those things. Can't you know it. what I mean? Like, there's yeah. no room for anybody else not to be doing those things if the $60 million quarterback's doing it. I totally agree. Um, meanwhile, so we have an interesting situation where Russell Wilson is sort of easing his way back into the equation. Um, Kyle Putting Allen. The eye came... black on for practice. <laughs> I mean, but did you see? Have you ever seen that before, by the way? I, like, I legitimately, a couple of people came at me like, oh, well, why wouldn't you wear it if the sun was out? I, I have never, I was racking my brain. I don't think I've ever seen a, a football player at any level wear eye black to practice. Have you? Mm, I don't know. I remember our coaches kind of not encouraging it because we were like kids with markers. Like we all just kind of got out of hand with it, you know? Well, I remember. Well, like, yeah. My, when, like when idiots, I, I think I know? told you the story of my freshman year, right? Where the ultimate warrior. No, like a bunch of us, like for our freshman football game, which is like on like a Monday afternoon or whatever. <laughs> um, the program had come out the year before. Oh, and so like, yeah. And so, like, we all went like full Braveheart with the eye black and the face paint and all that other stuff. And the um, the head coach of the varsity, who was a legend in our program, and um, like was also the assistant prin pr principal at the middle school, which is an amazing job for a varsity high school football coach. It's I like it's a perfect job. Yeah, you're the assistant principal in the middle school. So, yeah. uh, um, and he was a gym teacher before that for us. And uh, he walks in the locker room and sees us. And this isn't even his game. He's coaching. And he, he informs us that if we don't all go to the bathroom and wipe all the <laughs> S-H-I-T off of our face, that he, is, he, he will cancel the game. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, it's I, miss true, 19, though. I, I miss 1994. That was, uh, that was a good year. There are so many... Uh... <laughs> There's so many good moments like when you think back and we were we were playing in that era where it became cool to like, you you so you you and I kind of like in different like you were closer I would say to starting to play football like as like the bad boy hurricanes came and went and maybe yeah, like that the was cool like yeah you know that so the big towels and the you know like that big kind of shoulder thing. pads cowboy collars cowboy collars and then yeah. i was the the streamlined era where we're talking about the sticky gloves the ultimate warrior wristbands um you know well let me the, ask you this do you know what newmans are yeah okay good. i had newmans all right good good i was og like, newmans yeah newmans were like the only like when i was a kid when when i was playing that was the only football glove really yes that was like yeah. the only football glove. I I had a I had a very early pair of Newmans, and then 
what came out were, I don't know if you remember these, but I can still picture them in my head. They're Nike gloves and they were black and white. Like some of the fingers are black and some of the fingers were white. They had the big swoosh on the wrist where the, uh, where the Velcro came. Yeah. And then they had like kind of the perforated holes. And then like, you know, the, the rich kids started getting them. And then like, eventually, you know, you would, you know, it popped out. So everybody got them, but they had the thin, really thin wristbands that you would put, kind Mm -hmm. of oh they're like ones like that kind of like the tension big bands things yeah yes and then you'd put them kind of like on your biceps you know mm -hmm. and and all that stuff and uh <laughs> so many times like our our like our whatever peewee football coaches would be like you know if you don't get your ass in there and make a tackle i'm gonna throw those things we practiced that in front of a creek and it was just like i'm gonna throw those goddamn wristbands in the creek and like i just remember that like constantly being a thing We had a coach who, uh, I'm going since to kick I was a, you in the ass so hard, your, your the rest of your body's going to fly over those trees. <laughs> <laughs> I had a coach who I love dearly. I, I, uh, I, I, my favorite thing was my high school football coach. Um, uh, he would pick on the kids who had high SATs, um, and like say that they scored like 4,000 on their SAT, but they, which was like, obviously impossible. Like you scored 4,000 on your damn SATs and I can't get you and, and I can't teach you to pull. <laughs> like, <laughs> We had a guy who I still, I love dearly and, and always will. And he, um, he would like, I played center and he would always like push me out of the way and he'd be like, this is how you snap football and he'd get down. And then the, his, his camel lights and his lighter would fly out of his pants pocket and always hit the floor. And like, you're in fifth grade and you're like, what? Like that guy's about to go roast a bone when he's done like, uh, yelling at you. Um, in high school we had this area called the boards and it was like um it was our practice fields were kind of like the, the game field was up on like this hill and then below it there was the practice fields and then there was like a trench right before the woods and that's where they put the boards for line drills and um it was just like it was like four boards which were like just old like blocks of wood And it was like to kind of teach you to play with the right base. And it was so muddy and nasty down there. And that's where all the blocking drills were. And it was like, I think back then, like we sort of viewed those things as like, that's what built character, which I like, I, I gotta be honest. I like, I don't look back at that and think that was stupid. I think it was kind of cool. You know, if, if you believe in it, you know, Yeah. if you believe in it, it's cool. If it's like Because Matt there's like Patricia. a placebo effect, regardless of whether or not it's true, there's a placebo effect to it, you know? It, yeah. And it, it works when you're like 12. And then if Yeah. you're Matt Patricia and you build a half million dollar hill on the Lions facility and your $72 million guard breaks his foot on it running after practice, there's, there's the other end of that, right? right? But it's, uh, you know. Oh, I, I got a great anecdote last week doing some of um, my groundwork for the Thursday night game. Like the hill lives on, right? Matthew Judon has brought hill runs to the Falcons from the New England Hill. So the hill, the 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 the, the legacy of the New England of the Foxborough Hill lives on. So Matt Judon, Matt Judon is uh, is is bringing it to Atlanta the same way that uh, Matt Patricia brought it to Detroit. I don't know what I – well, I know what I would say. I don't know if I can say it on the podcast. If I'm a 32-year-old man playing professional football for a decade and someone says, hey, practice is over, we're going to go run hills. I think our I think if you want – our old colleague Rohan used to tweet what I would say uh, pretty regularly, and it's, you know, whatever. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a body part that you can dine on. Let's, let's say that. Um, but – I'm, I'm not going to try to figure that out. <laughs> um, Jets Vikings in London. I, um, uh, I, here's what I'll say. Um, the Vikings, I think I like are, how you're trying to measure your words there. I think so. I'll get, let me just get the Vikings out of the way with one thing. The Vikings are still hanging tough. This defense is awesome. Sam Darnold now, and this is so true. And I can't believe that people aren't, catching on to this it's four weeks guys four weeks and then that fifth week is when you can really tell if a player is has turned his career around changed his life whatever it is or if it's the scheme and defensive coordinators are able to get a beat on it all coordinators will tell you this i need four weeks of film give me four weeks of film Mm-hmm. so we're starting to see darnold slow down a little bit he's still moving the ball vikings get aaron jones back probably after the bye i think they're going to be fine they're five and oh right i mean Yep. barring some sort of catastrophic They meltdown have a lot like of this like is room going to for be error okay now. they have a They've lot built. of room for error they've really built themselves a runway the jets on the other hand have no room for error 
uh, because you have Buffalo coming on Monday Night Football now. Buffalo is going to be pissed off coming after that Houston game. And my thought is this, and I'm curious if you agree with me, but based on all the decisions that you have made leading up to this point, it makes the trading of for Devontae Adams not only a bonus, but a necessity. Because yep. down the stretch in that game, Albert, you had the... Um, The double move from Garrett Wilson, that was a touchdown. The communication issues, the chemistry issues are so apparent, it's not even funny. You had the throw to Mike Williams on which the Which was like, which like, looked game. like he was throwing a back shoulder, and Mike Williams wasn't running a back shoulder. And to Rodgers' credit, I was shocked that he took completely took the so blame for it. He said he underthrew it. Yeah, I talked to Steph Gilmore, though, after the game, and he said, I knew Aaron likes to throw back shoulders, so I was ready for it. Yeah. And so... That looked like a back shoulder throw to me. I don't know. I it looked to me too like he's saying, "Yo, Mike Williams, you're gigantic. Just be looking the whole time. Body and him throw up. Your body and yeah. body him up and catch the ball. Or at the very least, we're going to draw a pi off of this. You know? Yeah. I, like you're right. Like everything looks a little off. The communication, the chemistry. It's just, I, it's hard not to look at Devonte Adams and say Adams solves a lot of that. Uh, now he does have that chemistry with Alan Lazard, although there was one throw in the end zone that I felt like they could have done a little bit of a better job on yesterday where Lazard maybe should have come up with it. The problem is, you know, Lazard is, it's a lot of things have to go right for Lazard to be the guy, you know, on any given play, whereas Adams can be the guy on any play. So, you know, like, I don't know how you work all this out. It seems like the, the the chemistry between Rodgers and Garrett Wilson isn't in the best place right now. Obviously, Mike Williams is still getting his feet underneath him. Um, and I think based on the way you've structured the roster, the way you built your team, you sort of almost have to do this now. Yeah. I mean, there's no – and and it's really hard if you're Joe Douglas, right? Because um, – and this is something I didn't even think about until right now. But – Think about this, right? Uh, you have Devontae Adams like tweeting Edgar Allan Poe pictures, whatever. And I don't know if that's to drive the price up or to make, you know, get yourself some back end financial guarantees to, you know, make the market seem more robust than it is. And the market should be robust, right? He's a good player. Um, still in his prime. He was ripping it up with Gardner Minshew a couple weeks ago. But if you're Joe Douglas, everybody on earth knows that you need Devontae Adams. And so when the Jets call and they talk to the Raiders, it's like, oh, the, the price goes up a little bit. It's like when yep. you Google, um, it's like when you Google hotels and then mm -hmm. you look at the Marriott and then you come back and you close your laptop and then you Google it again. And the price is like $9 higher. Cause they know that you have to stay somewhere. You know, have you ever seen that kind of yeah. dynamic pricing? Right. Yeah. I do think that the Jets now are probably in a situation where, they're subject to a little bit of dynamic pricing here on Devonte Adams. Like everyone knows right. they need him. Uh, there's no turning back. At yeah. This and point, I think so. a two is too much for him probably from a value standpoint, but do they just give it up? You have to, I mean, like yeah. what, like what else are you going to do? Are you going to let Devonte Adams go to another team in the conference and have like six or seven big games before the playoffs start? And you still don't have Hassan Reddick because you wouldn't pay for him. And you still don't have Devonte Adams. Like that would be a fan mutiny. Yeah. No, yeah. Right. I mean, I, like, I, I, I think you are so leveraged into this year um, and trying to chase the championship this year. And you've, let's face it, you've already given the keys to Aaron. So there's no like, well, do we really need to kowtow? You've already kowtowed. Like, yeah, you're like, already just there. Go. Yeah. Just lean further into it, do it. And like, you figure out the rest as you go, but I, they need a spark from somewhere. Because I like the body language is bad. Um, the energy on the team doesn't look good. You wonder, like, the defense is playing really well. Like, when does it start to get to the defense? Um, I mean, they haven't given the defense hasn't given up much in the last like three weeks. So when does it start to wear on the defense having to carry the flag every week? That's what you're dealing with. That that those dynamics on the team. And I would imagine that Buffalo on that Monday night is gonna be a freaking hornet's nest. I might go. You should. Yeah. You Just should. To, you know, get on the ground, feel you're it big, out. You're a big Bills guy. 
smell it, smell it for myself, you know, get in there. Um, all right, we have uh, two more games before we get to the lightning round, but I have to get to these two games because I want to talk about them. And no one, so this was my first, I, I have, you know, we I watch every game every week, right? But this was the first time because of a fun little schedule oddity. Let me just tell you, my schedule, my setup on Sunday is two games on YouTube Sunday ticket and then whatever's local on the big screen. And so most Sundays, that is like two games that I want to see in the early window and then the Jets or the Giants, whichever game is better because a lot of times those teams both play at one o'clock. But mm -hmm. this week, the Giants played at 425. The Jets played at 930 in the morning. And so this is my first chance to see Jaden Daniels live and just not yeah. on tape two or three days later. My God, how awesome that is. Like it is unbelievable. And I couldn't help but thinking, and I wrote this on Sunday, that what Jaden Daniels is now is probably what Cleveland had thought they were getting yeah. from Deshaun Watson when they signed him. And like, and it's so funny to see the juxtaposition. Like, you know, I described two blitzes that were similar in nature. And mm -hmm. Deshaun at this point, and now there's a lot of nuance to this, and we'll get to that in a second. But Deshaun is basically kind of accepted the pressure as an inevitability at this point and just kind of takes it and, you know, yeah. and falls down. Jaden Daniels is evading these things and then throwing ropes to Terry McLaurin for 66. I mean, that years. one, that one was like just eye popping that throw. Like it was like when Ridiculous. I, I watched it live too. And when he let go of that, I was like, there's no way the ball gets there. It's and ridiculous. you see McLaurin like running behind the defense. Like there's no way. the ball. Oh my God. He got it there. Um, I think he throws – I I don't know if it would be sacrilege to say a rookie throws the best deep ball in football, but he might. Like, he just keeps hitting these. Like, it's that one. It's the one to Diami Brown. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we all saw what happened against the Bengals with the two ones deep to McLaurin. Um, and he's doing this, like, without a great, a great, like, core around him. You know? Like, it's McLaurin and what else at receiver. You know, it's – a tackle situation that's still a little bit of a mess. Yeah. Um, and we'll see what happens with the rookie at left tackle. It's Brian Robinson and Austin Eckler in the backfield. That's good. That's okay. You know, but, and then you look on their defense and it's like, they've still got a hole with the edge rushers. He's, they've still got holes at corner. I, I just like look at the, uh, the overall makeup of the team. And it's like, it's almost like I, I could almost, you almost equate it to like Andrew Luck, you know, in Indianapolis where the minute luck came in there, like the Colts were asking him to be the best player on the field a lot. It's sort of the same here. Like, and usually when a team coming off a bad year is asking a rookie quarterback to be the best player on the team, the results are a complete disaster. And I mean, Jaden's responded in just such a huge way. It's unbelievable. So everyone's making a big deal out of Kevin Stefanski saying that he's not going to change quarterbacks. Yep. And he had he had said that he had spoken to the locker room. I uh, you know I don't know man. What maybe maybe he has. Um, you know I think there's obviously an important subtext to that, which is can he bench him? Is he allowed to bench him? I think yeah. he should anyway. Um, because what would the Browns do if he benched him and Jameis Winston came in and ripped it up? I think that you can take the Deshaun Watson sacks and put them into three buckets. The first bucket is that the protection is bad. The yep. second bucket is that the way. <laughs> I think his that feels he's gone. Got, his feel's gone is the second bucket. And the third bucket is, I guess, related to the fact that your feel is gone. Um, you know, what are we doing to um what are we doing to align our backfield protections? And is Deshaun doing that? Is someone else doing that? Was yeah. was there a guy last year who was doing that who's not doing it anymore? What did Bill Callahan have something to do with that? And he's not there. Whatever it is, like, you know, you saw him get blindsided in this game over the weekend and Jerome Ford's on the other side of the formation, you know, and and trying to double or triple team someone. And so, I don't know, man. You know, I, I don't know. But he has become so beaten down that I just feel like there's no desire to evade. The, you know, he had that play against the Raiders a couple of weeks ago that was called back via hold. He had a couple of nice plays like that against the Jaguars, but other than that, I mean, it's it, it's I, non-existent, you know. So there was the thing that I think was a little unfair to him, where people were making assumptions on what he was doing. The video that got out there, right? Like, which was like Kevin Stefanski wanted to go for it on this fourth down, and then like Deshaun Watson called off the called out called off the dogs, and 
I like I, I guess what that really was was that Deshaun saw there were twelve guys in the huddle, and that was why Ke- and and told Kevin they had to burn the timeout, and um, and everybody is frustrated. Still, though, I think when you look at that clip and so many others, there's just this defeated body language right now with him, which is yep. like, I mean, it's just like you watch him play and there's no energy for football anymore. And I hate to be the body language doctor, but you like, you can see it. You can see when a guy thinks like, oh, I've got no chance here anymore. You know what I mean? And it feels like that's what we're watching with a guy who. I mean, we're further out now, but five years ago was going toe to toe with Patrick Mahomes in the divisional playoffs, and at one point held a twenty-four nothing lead at Arrowhead, and was legitimately right there with 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 Patrick Mahomes, right? Yeah, was legit in twenty nineteen, and this sounds crazy now. In twenty nineteen, legitimately was considered right there with Patrick Mahomes as one of the best young quarterbacks in football, and. um yeah, I mean, I don't know how much longer Kevin Stefanski can keep selling this to the locker room, especially if Jameis Winston is doing anything in practice that looks encouraging. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what But you then you hear that. the stories. You know, then you hear the stories that, like, part of the reason Joe Flacco isn't there is because that made Deshaun uncomfortable. That It's just – it's a mess. It is. It's, it's a mess, and I don't know what you do at this point. But – my theory still stands. If you're Kevin Stefanski, what you do is you cook up something for Jameis in the background. Mm-hmm. You bench Deshaun Watson after a series the next time he goes out there and takes five sacks. And you make sure that if you come at Watson, if you're mm-hmm. Stefanski, that you don't miss. And that yep. you have a great game out of Jameis and that you say, this is it. Sorry, guys. Yep. We're done. You know, you can't. And I wonder if this is part of it with Stefanski, right? You, you nobody wants that in yep. your huddle right nobody wants that nobody wants a quarterback that's just like you know every play is like oh here we go or screaming at your left tackle or right tackle whatever it was against the raiders um and even though he repaired the situation on the sideline like clearly it's not great right it's not a huddle that everyone wants to be in and he's not saying hey is that john candy over there you know it's not cool it's not fun and so if you're Stefanski, you see that you've coached the position for a long time. You know, even if Jameis Winston is Jameis Winston, having him bound in there and say something silly and just break up the tension and fire a ball down the field. OK, great. You know, like, let's do it. But if you're going to do it, you can't miss like you have to make sure that you are ready to go, that Jameis Winston is ready to go, that he's going to come in there and drive down the field and yeah. make it a no doubt situation where you know that Watson is going to stay on the bench permanently after that. Because you're screwed if you if it doesn't. Imagine work. if you put in Jameis Winston and he's worse. Yeah, that's right? where that's where you're like that's where you lose the team. All right, uh, gosh, we had to. We're, we're doing. The we have Lightning to demote concert. the Giants. Uh, yeah, Seahawks we, had, game. we had to demote the the Giants Seahawks, but we're going to start the lightning round here, and uh, and I will actually stick to five minutes because I think our producer okay. Shelby is going to murder me. Um, too much talk about wristbands today, Albert. When you, when you I might be collateral. Bands, I might be collateral damage in that in that murder. <laughs> my yeah, I might I might catch some of the 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 spray from the machine gun there. That's um, right. Um, big win here for Brian yeah. Dable and the Giants. Probably the second or third biggest win, I would argue, of the Brian Dable era. Uh, Tyrone Tracy Jr., 18 carries, 129 mm-hmm. yards. Uh, Daniel Jones played another good game, and Isaiah Simmons blocked a kick. Remember Isaiah Simmons, everybody? Like that, uh, you know, the hybrid linebacker out of Clemson, first round pick. He's still on the Giants. He just jumps over the center, blocks the kick, and then absolutely obliterates. The poor Seattle. I, I love that story, by the way, like because that's so cool to me because this is a guy who's kind of fallen out of he's fallen into disrepair as a defensive player. But like what a cool thing that like he has still found a career for himself. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, totally I, I just think it's an awesome story of perseverance and a guy sticking to it and and finding a home. And, you know, he's buying himself more time to develop as a defensive player. Obviously, it didn't work out. Um, the way we all saw him when he was at Clemson, which was like this player of the future. And it, it obviously went from like, oh, this guy can do everything to he's not really good enough at anything to stick on defense. He's found a way to, 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 to carve out a role on a football team. So that's great. I also like the Giants' young players 
developing and contributing the way that they did. And we know what neighbors has done. And obviously he didn't play yesterday, but for like guys like drew Phillips, um, you know, from their rookie class to, to come up and make plays in the game, I thought was really huge. Um, cause that's what the giants need. You know, they need their young players. You mentioned Tracy's another one. Um, they need their young players to start to make an impact. And so between Phillips, Tracy and neighbors, when he gets back, it looks like they've got a solid rookie class going there too. I have the Giants 8 and 9, 9 and 8. I still think that's a possibility. And in the NFC East, you never know what could happen. All right. Um, Bears 36, Panthers 10. Uh, I would just say read Albert's column. He's got uh, Caleb Williams stuff up right now on SI.com. Uh, 304, two touchdowns, no mm-hmm. interceptions. Meanwhile, Bryce Young gets into the tail end of this one to basically take up the mop-up beating. And so <laughs> it'll be interesting to see uh, where the Panthers go from here uh, because it, it really doesn't do you yeah. any good at this point to have Andy Dalton in. I, so. I, I love the, the example that Bears have sort of set where it's like they let Caleb. This is almost like... You know how, like, we always see quarterbacks now and, like, you got to set them up to succeed and build their confidence. I think it's sort of interesting how – I think they've almost taken, like, a Colts in 1998 with Peyton Manning approach to developing Caleb Williams where it's like, no, we're going to go out there and we're, we're a good enough team. We're going to let him make his mistakes. We're not going to ask him to be a superstar on every play. We're good enough on defense and special teams to win games in different ways. And, like, we'll just let Caleb live through it. And I think it's starting to pay dividends now. I think things are starting to slow down for him. And um, he played really, really well. Those throws to DJ Moore, I mean, within structure, on schedule, they weren't like crazy scramble play plays, I think are real signs of progress. Spectacular. Uh, Dolphins 15, Patriots 10, probably the worst NFL game of the season. I don't think there's – like, <laughs> honestly, I mean, no offense to anybody, but this was uh, an absolute fire into the sun game. And if the Patriots think that they're going to put Drake May behind this offensive line, they're completely delusional. Um, save Drake May at all costs. Do not play him. Do not play him. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add here, Albert, but this was not a game that I would uh, – I'm not going to remember fondly in my uh, – I mean – like the only thing I have to say is like, this is why it's important to invest in backup quarterbacks. The dolphins did last year with Mike white. And it's not like you couldn't have seen injury issues coming when two is your quarterback. So mm-hmm. I just don't understand how the dolphins who have been a pretty smart organization the last few years, put themselves in this spot. Raiders Broncos. Despite the win. <laughs> Raiders Broncos 34 Broncos Raiders 18 uh really cool uh day for Bo Nix and Brock Bowers I think both uh team's mm-hmm. first round picks had some nice days uh l- l- enjoyed uh Bo Nix kind of jawing back at Sean Payton a little bit oh like, yeah that was good they, they juxtaposed him screaming at Russell Wilson last year and Russell just being like all right yeah but Bo getting back after him and then Sean Payton calling him Ferris Bueller afterwards which I don't <laughs> understand kind of shows his age a little bit like Bo Nix is just and uh, there's That's a great, great break. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what? Do you know what Sean Payton's nickname was, as dubbed by Bill Parcells? What? Dennis the Menace. <laughs> These are just like, Bonex is like I'm 24. Like Ferris Bueller came out when I was negative no. 11 years old. You know. But the fact that the fact that Bill Parcells called <laughs> Sean Payton Dennis the Menace because he thought his offensive scheme ideas were outlandish is pretty classic. It's pretty amazing. Uh, by but the I way. Thought, uh, Nice someone's, turning point game for Bonix. Someone's pets are tan. T- take from last week looks pretty smart. It does. It does. Great video clip by producer Shelby, by the way. That Thanks, could, Shelby. So, so we were out there first on the pets are tan thing. Um, Packers 24, Rams 19. LA just needs the cavalry at this point. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I think a good game for the Packers in terms of, you know, Josh Jacobs, you got going a little bit, three mm-hmm. three point eight yards carry. Tucker Kraft was the big one, right? Two touchdowns, four catches, yeah. 88 yards. Um, we don't know what's going on with Romeo Dobbs at this point, but the rest of this receiving core is incredibly deep and I think they're going to be able to figure it out. Yeah. Deep and balanced and growing up together with Jordan love. Um, I liked how the defense, you know, Jeff Hathley's first year as defensive coordinator, they really needed to get a stop there at the end and they did it. Um, Xavier McKinney looks like one of the best free agent signings. I feel like we should throw that in there too. Um, guy five came picks over in the five Giants. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's done a fantastic job. Bonkers. And then Jags Colts, uh, you know, Good for Jacksonville. Uh, you get a W heading into uh, London. Doug Peterson looked less like the Walking Dead at the podium uh, this week, and um, but Joe still, Flacco almost pulled it off. He almost pulled it off, and he's just great. Like he, there's so it's good. This for team is so awesome. Like 
whether it's Ant- like it's Anthony Richardson one week and then Joe Flacco the other week, and they're doing throwbacks across the field and reverses, and Shane Steichen's motion packages are just batshit crazy. Uh, Colts are must watch every week. Once, Richard, once Anthony Richardson gets back in the lineup, the Browns should give him a call. <laughs> Can't imagine why they didn't before. <laughs> Oh, all right. That was our best lightning round ever. We were supposed to do five minutes. We did six minutes, 38 seconds. That's pretty uh, good. That's progress. But that's Solid better progress. for us learning to shut up. So remember, guys, next week, a little bit of a format change. We are losing the lightning round because your bad teams are just weighing us down. We're going to do the big games at the top, and then we're going to spin the NFL ahead uh, for the next week. Enjoy the rest of your Monday into the rest of the week. We're going to be back with you guys. And uh, thanks for listening.